so now as 17 talks about segment reporting okay so basically as the word itself tells that it is segment reporting so therefore this is basically a disclosure standard thereby what should be reported segments are supposed to get reported where do you report it notes to financial statements you are going to report it now a question comes what do we mean by a segment so segment is supposed to get reported what do you mean by segment now before we move on towards the uh, technical definition of the word segment and all before we deal with that first what we need to see is why this particular disclosure became important the reason is very simple now when it comes to your overall profitability statement now you can see that there are businesses which are highly diversified in nature example say you have got wipro which has got different products there is hul hindustan unilever limited which has got different products there is itc which is a very good example where they are involved in different types of products say if i talk about say itc it has got stationery it has got hotel it has got uh, tobacco it has got FMCG, there are so many businesses which is considered for ITC. Now, entire combined element, entire combined profits, combined revenue will be shown in PNL. Now, PNL doesn't tell that how much is from tobacco, how much is from FMCG. No, it directly tells revenue from operation is this much. So, indirectly, even profits are also overall. So, as a shareholder, as a user, how do I come to know how individual elements are working? What is the profit through tobacco? How much is the profit through papers? If I want to know them individually, how is it possible? For that, segment reporting comes into the picture. Thereby, in detail analysis is done for that in-between element for the purpose of reporting. So that is how segment reporting ka requirement came into the picture for Level 1 entity, this is compulsory or non-SMC, it is compulsory. Others, it is recommended. It's not compulsory for them. So, this is how segment reporting requirement came into the picture. Now, whenever we talk about segment then, so basically what did we learn about segment? Segments are a component whereby different components will be there. That will be considered for segment purpose. So, whenever there are segments, now, first we have to see the meaning individually. These segments are divided into two types. One, we call it as business segment. Second is called as geographic segment. Okay. Now, what do we mean by a business segment? Okay. Now, it is one distinguishable component it's a distinguishable component related to product or services how it is distinguished with risks and rewards Okay, so again I repeat, what are business segment? They are different distinguishable component of a particular company and they have in what? In products or services having different risks and reward. So basically, distinguishable component means what? From one product to the other, there has to be distinguishing between the products. So basically, distinguishable component of products or services having different risk and rewards example stationary and fmcg are indistinguishable they are not the same so stationary is one type and uh, fmcg is the other type products or services so product fmcg is product and stationary is product and it contain or it should contain different risk and reward obviously yes stationary has got one type of risk and reward fmcg has got the other type of risk and reward 
So suppose if we say that there is a health problem everywhere in the country, automatically FMCG might take a hit. Suppose we say that no paper should be used for environmental purpose, stationery will have a problem. So every these two has got different risk and reward. These are called as business segment. So distinguishable component under products or services having different risks and rewards that will be called as business segment. What do you mean by geographic segment? Again, it's a distinguishable component It is a distinguishable component in what? In location having different risks and rewards. So when it comes to geographic segment, it depends upon location. I'll give you an example. Say we will take a company like Infosys. Now Infosys what happens? They have got its software customers everywhere in the world. So there is US, there is India, there is UK, there are other European countries, there is Australia, there are so many countries where one company is going to give its services to everyone. Now the point is each location will be distinguished. The US and Indian market are not the same. So whatever they are trying to have, say if maximum sales for example is happening in USA, at that time shareholders should be said na, that USA contains our maximum customers. So if anything bad happens, if there is a regulatory requirement in USA that Indian companies cannot enter, example, that Indian companies cannot enter over there. What happened? These companies where their maximum customers are in that particular region that every sales are now got cut. So these people are going to bear a lot of pain there. This has to be known by the shareholders. So therefore, so what is happening? Distinguishable component related to location now. So US location, US and India are not the same. India and UK are not the same. US and UK are not the same. Every country will have its own risks and rewards. So that location which contains different risk and reward, that has to be considered as geographic segment. So if there is distinguishable risk and reward in product, it is business. Distinguishable risk and reward with location, it is geographic. Now when it comes to location, what location are they talking about? This location can be either location of assets or it could be location of customers. Any of the two location is fine. So where the assets are, where the production is taking place, that location or the location of the customers. Those should give you different risk and reward. Okay, example. So that whether this location should be different countries only, no, it could be different region also. Of the same country, different region as well. So if you take India, the risk and reward in Delhi or say Kashmir and the risk and reward say for any place say Rajasthan. So what happens at that time? Say there is cloth industry where the risk and reward in Kashmir and Rajasthan are entirely different. Say woolen clothes if I want to sell, in Kashmir it will be more, in Rajasthan it won't be there at all. So automatically what happened, different region became a location which is distinguishable for different risk and reward. So that's how business and geographic segment comes into the picture. Now a question comes, in a situation if there are both segments, What should be done? Say, I, I, I am dealing in different products. At the same time, I am dealing in different locations also. Both of them have different risk and reward. Automatically what happened? There is business segment. Also, there is geographic segment. At that time, you are supposed to distinguish them as primary segment and secondary segment. Now, what is the importance of this? Primary segment will normally have more disclosure. Secondary segment will have less disclosure. Okay. So if in a situation both segments are there, then choose one as primary segment. Choose the other as secondary segment. How is that related to? How can you do that? 
how can you choose something as primary how can you choose something as secondary now it totally depends upon dominant source of risks and rewards okay management will take the decision normally about this which one is more dominant so obviously different risk and reward will lead to business segment geographic segment but which one is more dominant whether product is dominant for them or the areas are dominant for them okay for example say itc has got different product i would say product is more dominant than the location so automatically if product is dominant then primary segment will be business segment suppose if location is dominant i will write it here only if location is dominant then primary segment will be geographic now whenever business becomes primary automatically geographic becomes secondary whenever geographic becomes primary business will become secondary but it depends upon dominant source of risk and reward so which one is more dominant that will be assigned suppose suppose dominant you can apply it for both business segment as well as geographic segment say in a hypothetical situation both of them are dominant at that time what should be done if both are dominant then business is primary geographic is secondary okay suppose if management is totally under confusion that both are dominant i don't know what to do you feel that both are dominant then business has to be considered as primary geographic will come as secondary so that is how you have to choose the primary secondary segments in a particular situation okay so first what are the segments we have business and geographic if both of them are there in a single organization then choose which one is primary and which one is secondary then next question comes are we supposed to report all the segments say in my company i've got say around 12 segments are am i supposed to tell about all the 12 segments maybe it is difficult for them for that the standard said something called as reportable segments so in a particular situation if at all some out of 12 if only seven comes under reportable segment then report only these seven specifically others will be done on an overall basis you will not do it specifically so only those segments which comes under reportable segments are compulsorily supposed to get reported as different segments okay so these reportable segments are supposed to get reported separately now how to decide something as a reportable segment then so for reportable segment there are five conditions and out of these five conditions if any one condition is satisfied then it is a reportable segment important from the exam angle so remember these things properly so for remembrance purpose okay seg uh, the standard has given beautiful sentences in for this particular stuff but for remembering point i'll just bring it up one by one first depending upon revenue depending upon revenue now it tells that segment revenue should be greater than or equal to 10% of total segment revenue now what are these terms i will tell you afterwards so segment revenue should be greater than or equal to 10% of total segment revenue example total segment revenue is 1000 okay take 10% of this to take 10% what happens 100 will come any segment having 100 or more as their segment revenue are reportable segments 
Okay, that's how it should be done. Second one, relating to result. Result is basically profit or loss. Anything related to result. Now, what does it tell? It tells that segment result should be greater than or equal to 10% of total segment under profits or total segment under loss whichever is higher and consider the amount in absolute terms. What do you mean by absolute term? No sign or what do you mean by absolute term? Positive or negative. So don't consider the signs along with it. Signs matlab positive or negative. Consider only amount. That will be considered over here. See, what do we mean by result? Or how reportable segments are done according to result? If segment result is greater than or equal to 10% of total segment under profit or total segment under loss, whichever is higher. Okay, I'll give you an example for this. Assume that there are 5 segments A, B, C, D and E and each of them say A has a positive 100, B has negative 40, C has positive 20, D has negative 70 and E has positive 40. Okay, now this is how you have got different result of a segment. Now, first merge. Okay, so first consider the merging effect of all the positive ones. How much do I get? All the profit making segments will give me uh, 160. How much is the loss making segment giving me 40 plus 70, 110? Now, first, what should I do? Keep all the profit making segment in one place, in one basket. Keep all the negative making segments or loss making segments in the on the other basket. Then compare the two. For these, do not consider sign. Because you can easily say that loss will be in negative, profit will be in positive. Positive is always more than negative. No. Do not consider sign. Absolute terms. So you have to only consider the numbers. So it is 160 or 110, whichever is higher. Which one is higher? 160 is higher. Of this 160, consider 10%. So how much do you get? 16 you get. Any number, profit or loss, doesn't matter. Any result more than or equal to 16 are reportable segments. If you could see here, all of them are more than 16. So, just take it up. All the se segments are more than 16. Okay. Again, I am telling you cannot say negative is there and all. Don't consider the sign. Only consider the number. That number is more than or equal to 16. It is reportable segment. So, that's how you have to understand this. So, this is the result element for the purpose of uh, your segment reportability. Next, third one, assets. This is easy related to segment assets. So, we say segment assets segment assets greater than or equal to 10% of total segment assets. That's it. So, take the total of all the segment assets, take 10% Check your individual segment. Anything more than or equal to 10% of total segment asset are reportable segment. Okay. Fourth one. Overall. Overall. Now, what does overall test is going to tell us? How overall mechanism should be considered for reportability? Now, external revenue of Reportable segment is 
should be greater than or equal to 75% of enterprise revenue. Okay, now this to understand the terms should be known, but I will tell you the individual term a bit later. But still, for understanding this, I'll just tell you that when it comes to segment revenue, it can contain both external sales and inter segment sales. Okay, say for example, FMCG, it has got outside sales of all FMCG. For hotels also, it is one of my other unit. For hotels also, my FMCG products are only getting supplied. So for FMCG, external sales will come, even inter-segment sales will come. So when segment revenue is considered, both of them will be considered. Okay, but what about enterprise revenue? Enterprise revenue means revenue of the company. For enterprise revenue, will they consider the inter-segment thing? No, because company is one broken up into segments and you cannot make transaction with yourself. So enterprise revenue basically means external. It's the sales of the company. So we tell in this case what is said then segment ka external sales should be at least 75% of company sales. Company sales is also external. So external sales should be minimum 75% of what? Of reportable segments. How did I know the reportable segment? You have already checked it in first three. So first three, you got your reportable segment. You have to now check overall that whether this reportable segment has got an external revenue at least 75% of total external revenue. Total external revenue is called as enterprise revenue. If yes, no problem. If no, add other non-reportable segments. So whatever other non-reportable segments you have, you just try to add up things to make sure that external sales of reportable segment minimum 75% of total enterprise revenue. Okay, this is overall mindset. So if I have to give you an example, assume that enterprise revenue, enterprise revenue is 500 rupees. Okay, then. Reportable segments are P, Q and R. These three are my reportable segment. Each of them has got 50. This is say 150. This is 200. Okay. These are the external revenue. Now check. These are the three reportable segments I have. These three are the external revenue. So 50 plus 150 gives me 200, 200 plus 200 will give me 400. Okay, now what should I do? Take 500 into 75%. Take 500 into 75%, you get 375. How much is considered external revenue of these reportable segment? 400. Did it match? Whether it is minimum 75%? Yes, which means Stop it. No problem. Now, whatever reportable segment you have, it is within the limit. Suppose if I make a slight change, I will make this again as 100 itself. This instead of 200, I will make it 100 now. What happens? 100 plus 150 is 250. 250 plus 50 is 300. But how much is the minimum? 375. So now you don't have minimum 75%. So what should I do? Add other non reportable segment, at least the enterprise revenue should touch 375, or the external sales of these segment should reach 375. Till that, keep on adding your other segments, other non reportable segment. Once you reach 375, it's done. Now, a question comes should we choose these segments only? No, any segments non reportable, add it up over here. It's left to the management. Okay, so that is how overall is supposed to be done. So overall, all the reportable segments should at least touch 75% of enterprise revenue. If yes, no problem. If no, add others. Okay, finally, fifth one, management choice.
apart from these mandatory segments if at all management wants to add some other segments is totally left to them so if you want to report all the segments then no problem at all if you reduce it there is a problem if you want to show everybody or if you want to full have full disclosure no issues whatsoever so these are the five conditions any one condition satisfied will come under reportable segment so revenue more than 10% result all profit making in one place loss making on the other place minimum 10 uh, then take 10% of uh, sorry whichever is higher take 10% then decide about it don't consider sign of the thing positive or negative doesn't matter third asset minimum 10% overall the external sales of the segment should reach a minimum of 75% of enterprise revenue if yes no problem if no add other non reportable segments then finally management choice anything other than these if the management wants to add up totally left to them so these are the reportable segments what we have now looking into the terms which are used in that reportable segment now let's quickly understand what the terms are all about first what do we mean by segment revenue what do we mean by segment revenue first contains external sales external sales second it contains inter segment sales also it contains external sales it contains inter segment sales also okay then what are the exclusions exclusions are mainly two profit on sale of investment then income from investment because these are not going to aid any business as such okay, you need business related elements which is related to that particular business so you need business related ones here investments are not directly linked to that business investment is excess income received because of investing a particular asset so therefore they are not supposed to be included but at all the business of the concern itself is investment then it is going to come example for a trading concern investments are not there directly related ones so therefore profit as well as income are exclusion from revenue however if at all it's a financial institution earning income and profit on sale of investments are their primary business at that time it comes under segment revenue so if at all the business itself is finance then include it so basically if finance related then include it otherwise it is excluded this is about segment revenue okay then second one segment expense segment expense okay starting with what are the inclusions operating expense incurred whatever operating expense the segment has incurred that is going to come as segment expense next if at all there is any attributable expense from the head office expense has been incurred related to that segment only but it was taken up in head office now they are attributing it now they are allocating it that is fine okay so any operating expense and any attributable expense are a part of segment expense now what are excluded exclusions just like your revenue over here also interest cost is excluded interest cost is excluded again remember until and unless you are a financial institution if you are a financial institution then interest becomes your main expense then it will be included then next exclusion any tax related expense are always excluded remember this point carefully any tax related expense are always excluded okay then third if there is overall head office expense then even they are also excluded 
not supposed to be considered. Head office will have its expense. Ultimately, head office doesn't make any business. It's only for correlating the business. So for them, whatever expense is incurred, ultimately on a basis they keep on putting into different segments. That is not considered over here. If it is segment expense only which is given by the head office, no problem. For example, expense of segment is met by the head office. So head office later said, I will now apportion that particular part to you. Then no problem. But head office ka expense, head office only incurred, but they want for appropriation and management purpose, they want to put it. That is not possible. So those things are not covered. Overall head office expense are not covered over here. These are supposed to be excluded. This is about segment expense. Then third one, what do I mean by enterprise revenue? Enterprise revenue basically means revenue of company. So, since it is revenue of company, it will only contain external sales. For company, segment doesn't matter because segment is only a division in their own company. So, everything will go towards external people. So, only external sales are covered over here. Then, fourth one. What do we mean by segment assets? First, operating assets, whatever segment related assets they have, which is used for the purpose of business, those operating assets will be covered. Then, if there are any head office allocated assets. Now, what do you mean by head office allocated asset? It basically means if at all there is an asset belonging to segment, but it is maintained by the head office. Maybe the records are with the head office. Now those allocated assets are only covered over here. So which means it is used by segment. Not everything could be just put in over here. It should be used by the segment. Then only it will be done. Then what are the exclusions? Two things are excluded. One, tax related assets are already always excluded. Okay, then second, general head office assets are always excluded. So, if any assets are used by the segment which head office is going to allocate, then no problem. It is going to be segment asset only. But if at all head office ka building, head office are using those assets, they are not covered under segment asset. So, if anything has to be segment asset, segment has to use it. Not, not anybody else. So, those people are excluded over there. So, these are for segment assets. Finally, segment liability. Same like segment asset. So, operating liability. So, which means related to business, whatever they have, those things will be covered. Then, HO allocated liability. Again, it should be belonging to, borrowings belonging to segment, not anything else. If anything specifically is belonging to segment, then only it is covered. Again, exclusions. Tax related are always excluded and head office. Head office has made any borrowings that cannot be considered as segment borrowings. So these are the terms what you have to know. So now if you remember segment revenue means what? External plus intersegment. Later segment result means what? Revenue minus expense. Expense we saw now. What are the inclusions and exclusions? Segment asset means what? Segment asset and segment liability. So these are the ones what we have to consider from our terms point of view. From these, reportable segment could be derived. Finally, what are the disclosure to be done? Presentation wise, segment reporting, what are the disclosure to be done? Or what are the reporting to be done? It is in connection to reporting. Okay, first, related to primary segment, then secondary. Related to primary segment, what are things to be disclosed? Number one, segment revenue 
there separately you have to show external and inter segment so whenever you have segment revenue external and inter segment should be separately shown second one segment result expense are not shown as a separate is uh, reporting only result will come but for getting result you want revenue minus expense third segment asset fourth segment liability fifth cost incurred on segment asset during the year So, if there are any acquisition made of segment asset during the year, that cost should be shown. Next, depreciation and amortization. Then, last, other non cash expense. So, these are your primary reporting format. Now, it depends upon which one it is business or geographic, doesn't matter. If it is business, then individual business, segment uh, revenue and segment result, everything. So, it depends upon which one is primary, whether it is geographic or business, doesn't matter, that has to be taken up. What should be done under secondary now? At all, it is a secondary segment, what should be done? If it is a secondary segment, then the disclosures are very limited. One, segment revenue. In this segment revenue, in this only external is set. You need not disclose inter segment revenue, only external revenue. If, if you disclose, it is more than enough. Second, segment asset. Segment asset. Third, cost incurred on segment asset during the year. So, this is your secondary reporting. Only three things are reported under secondary. Okay. So, this is how you have to deal with the reporting aspect. So, for these we have seen the terms. What is segment revenue? What are there in that? What is segment result? What is segment asset? We have seen them. That has to be considered for the purpose of calculation. So, this is how you have to deal with segment reporting. So, these are the theoretical aspects of segment reporting. So, what type of segment I have? Business and geographic. After that, what is business segment? What is geographic segment? Later, if both of them are there, then what should I do? Whether all segments are supposed to be report, reported? No, only reportable segment should be done. How do you get reportable segment? Any one condition of the five. Later, what are the reporting done? Primary, secondary. So, this is how you have to now remember and understand how uh, AS17 ka theory comes into the picture. Now, let us move towards one or two problems again. Let us get to know about the problems. Oh, sorry, I think I opened the old one. Yeah, so now let us get to know about the problems so that we will try to understand what it is all about. First one. A company has an inter-segment transfer pricing policy of charging at cost less 55%. The market prices are generally 20% above cost. We are required to examine whether the policy adopted by the company for pricing inter-segment transfer at reduced prices is correct or not in line with AS prov provisions of AS 17. Now, what is happening is between segments, they have a transfer price, obviously. One will sell, the other one will buy. So, for transfer pricing purpose, they said it is given at 5% below cost. But the market price is 20% above cost. Now, they are asking, is it correct or not? First, whatever is happening between segments, will it affect the company on the whole? The answer is no. Because for company, whatever is happening inside the segment, it doesn't matter to them. Whatever the segment is doing with the external customers, that matter to them. 
So therefore, first of all, it doesn't matter from the overall angle of the company. One. Second, however, segment revenue includes inter-segment sales. So segment revenue includes inter-segment sales. So therefore, putting a particular price is not compulsory. So they can sell it at below cost. They can sell it at at cost. They can sell it at above cost also. They can sell it at market price also. Any price is fine provided they have to disclose whatever they have taken and they consistently follow the same pattern. One time they say below cost, one time they say above cost. Now that is not correct. Whatever you have chosen, you should disclose it. You should consistently follow it. Why? Because that is a part of your inter-segment sales. So therefore, it has to be considered like this. So you can have any transfer pricing policy. There is no problem, but you have to disclose, maintain them consistently. Now, if you could see here, it should be measured on the basis that enterprise actually used to price these transfers. The basis of inter-segment transfer should be disclosed in the financial statement. Okay, and it can have its own policy for pricing inter-segment transfer and hence inter-segment transfer may be based on cost, below cost or market price. Whether whatever policy should be followed should be disclosed and applied consistently. So whatever we discussed, institute also produced the same answer. Okay, next one. The chief accountant of Cotton Garments Limited gives the following data regarding its five segments A, B, C, D, E and total segment asset segment result, segment revenue. The chief accountant is of the opinion that segment A alone should be reported. Is he justified? Examine his opinion in light of provision of AS 17. Now, point is five segments and three bases has been given. We know that now you can apply asset test, result and revenue. You can try with all these three and what have we come to the conclusion? If at all a segment comes under any one of them, it will be a reportable segment. Now let's start one by one. If I go with first revenue, I will first go with revenue. Revenue wise, total is 450. What is the revenue point? Segment revenue greater than or equal to 10% of total segment revenue. 10% is how much? 45. Anything has got 45 or more than 45, only first one, 310. So, according to revenue, only A will be the reportable segment. Now, let's go with the asset part. Because the asset and the revenue has got the same rules. So, asset part 80, 10% is 8. So, 8 or more than 8, if anything is covered, that will be reportable. Which has got 8 or more than 8? A, B, C as well as D. E doesn't have it. That is for reportable segment under asset test. Last, the result wise. Now, when it comes to result alone, don't take 10% of 75. No, no. What should I do? First, add up all the profit making. Profit making how much? 5 plus 5 plus 15. 25. Then apply loss making. Loss, 95 plus 5, 100. Whichever is higher, which one is higher? Loss is higher, 100. Take 10%. 10% 10 is 10. So now, result without signature, without any sort of positive negative effect, amount wise, anything equal to or more than 10. Which one are they? This one, 95 is there. Then 15 is there. So therefore, these are the reportable segment. If in any one it is satisfied, they are reportable. So, A, there is a tick, so it is reportable. B, it is a reportable. C, D, E, all of them are reportable. So, that has been presented over here. First, they mentioned what are the revenue part, how result will come, how assets will come. On that basis, they mentioned A will come under revenue, under result A and E will come, under asset, all except E is going to come. Therefore, all segments are reportable. So, that is how AS17 comes into effect. It talks about AS22, accounting for taxes on income. Uh, 
okay so now this basically this standard tells about the correlation between accounting and taxes which taxes since it is income it is income tax so accounting and income tax you try to make some sort of uh, relationship that will be called under this particular standard of as22 so what is the need of this particular standard one for disclosure purpose it is important second for matching concept it is important so as22 majorly requires that matching concept mechanism what it is assume that you have got profit before tax in your accounting as 100 rupees assume that tax rate is 30% now do you can calculate directly 30% on pbt of accounting no what you will do you will go to income tax act you will calculate pgbp and assume that according to pgbp you got 60 rupees because we know that in pgbp you got different section section 30 to 44 there are so many sections in pgbp 28 to 44 is the coverage for that so 30 to 37 you got admissible expense then you got inadmissible expense so after that you got a tax profit of 60 rupees now a question comes whether you pay tax on 100 rupee pbt of accounting or whether you will pay tax on 60 rupee which is according to income tax law obviously we will pay according to income tax law so what you will do 60 into 30 percent you will apply how much do you get 18 rupees you get this is your tax then you will continue profit after tax then profit for the year etc etc but once you once a user looks into this financial statement what is user saying it's not correlated if 30 percent is the tax how much tax should have come 30 rupees how much it's coming 18 rupees why that difference took place because of it law but will you show it law calculation financial statement no so now for matching this principle as22 came into the picture as22 said we will now think about why it got that difference came into the picture and how can we try to stop that difference how can we try to gap, bridge the gap over there so that is covered under as22 accounting for taxes on income okay so what is happening then first there will be profit according to accounting you call this as accounting income then you have got profit according to it law you call this as taxable income then you have got tax according to accounting you call this as tax expense and there is tax according to it law you call this as current tax so basically everything in connection to taxation and accounting is covered over here so basically profit according to accounting you call it as accounting income uh, profit according to it law you call it as taxable income then later tax according to accounting is called as tax expense or uh, tax according to it law will be considered as current tax now why there is a difference between these is what we are trying to take it up over here once we know the difference we will try to bridge the gap possible we will do it otherwise it is not supposed to be done so this is the coverage of as22 to match the element between accounting and taxes otherwise tax law will be entirely different accounting will be entirely different shareholders will get confused as to how to interpret them for that this becomes a bit easier one now first when it comes to accounting income and taxable income there will be certain differences because you have learnt both accounting and taxes you know 
accounting goes with accrual principle with different set of accounting norms tax will go with taxation provisions so whatever the law is uh, enacted by the government accordingly it will be there so both of them can never be the same there will be differences so why the differences between accounting income and taxation income arose one the differences can be of two types in that first one is called as timing difference second one is called as permanent difference example say you have got a section called as section 40 in the section 40 there is a clause related to tds now what does that clause related to tds tell us it tells that in the resident uh, non resident both of them are covered there but say i will go with resident rule it says if at all during the previous year or within the due date of filing income tax returns if at all there is no TDS made on the payment to a resident or TDS is made but not deposited with the government then 30% is disallowed. I think everybody would have come across this provision at least once that if at all according to section 40 if TDS is not done then 30% of the expenditure is disallowed. When it will be allowed? It will be allowed in the year in which TDS is made. So next year if they make TDS, they make the payment, everything is now done properly, they are back to the normality, then you will be allowed to deduct it in the next year. Okay, this is one. Second, there is 43B. There are set of payments which should be actually paid. Accrual, they won't give you any sort of deduction. It should be actually paid. There are some five or six payments which is mentioned by the law. Now, what does that tell? It tells that if not paid, disallowed. If paid later, allowed. 2017-18, they did not pay, disallowed. 2019-20, they paid, allowed. So, on the year of actual payment, it will be allowed as deduction. Now, why am I listing th some things like these and that too under timing difference? Now, if you could look into these, there is one similar nature which is happening. What is that? Reversal in future. It got disallowed in the current year, but in the next year it got allowed. Which means, whatever effect was got created, Whatever difference got created in the current year got finally uh, closed down in the next year. As simple as that. This thing is called as timing difference. So, if any difference which is created between accounting and taxes, which could be reversed in future, you call them as timing difference. Now, when it comes to the second one, assume that there is sections again related to donation where you can see that some of the payments are related with 150% deduction. In accounting, you will only give 100% deduction because that's the actual amount of donation. But for taxes, they give you extra benefit. They say, I'll give you 150% deduction. Now, a question comes. Once if this is taken, say if 100 rupees donated, According to accounts, it is 100. According to tax, it is 150. Whether these two differences will be closed down any time, the answer is no. It's done. 150 is deducted from IT law. Done. Second. Second. Assume that there is a cash payment related stuff. 40B. Uh, it talks about cash payments now. Now, if according to cash payment, it says that if you make more than 10,000 payment in cash, it is disallowed in the books of the assessee according to IT law. But accounting does it tell? No. Accounting, if you pay in cash, you pay in check is left to you. We will directly put that up in the books of accounts. So, what happens now? Whether once, say for example, a purchases are made and I pay 40,000 rupees on cash. Is a disallowed one. Will they allow this particular expenditure at any time in future? 
the answer is no they don't so what happened these things are called as permanent difference meaning no reversibility or no reversal so there is a requirement of reversal in timing difference that whatever you did now will be reversed in future examples i have written 43b is an example 40 is an example preliminary expense is an example depreciation is an example even though you maintain different depreciation method, ultimately in both places, asset will turn zero. So, therefore, depreciation is an example. So, all these things are timing difference. But if there is no reversibility, you call them as permanent difference. That difference is permanently done. So, whenever there are differences from AS22 angle, if it's a permanent difference, then ignore it. You can't do anything about it. Because accounts and tax are not getting attached whenever permanent difference come in, comes into the picture. There is no single attachment towards it. There is no re relation itself. However, if there is timing difference, then create deferred taxes. So, for timing difference, deferred taxes are created. So, AS22 ka major requirement is that deferred taxes, which comes under timing difference. Okay, then timing difference, other one is permanent difference. Permanent difference is gone case. It cannot be considered in any way. Only timing difference is supposed to get considered. Okay, I will give you an example now. Say there is accounting profit, then there is taxation profit. Okay, profit initial one is similar to both say 2 lakh rupees okay then there is bonus which is payable in the current year paid in the next year okay payable in the current year paid in the next year assume that both the amount is 50000 50,000 is the value. Now think about it. Bonus payable. Accounting follows accrual system. So therefore, they will write 50,000 bonus. But bonus is covered in 43B, which tells that it should be actually paid. If you don't pay it, you won't get deduction now. In the year of actual payment, you will get deduction. So will you be deducting that from taxation profit? No. So what happened? 150 became your accounting income. 2 lakh became your taxable income. 1 lakh 50 accounting income, 2 lakh is the taxable income. Now, tax rate, let's assume it to be 30 percent. So, this became 45,000, this became 60,000. Okay, so now what is happening then? Over here, there arose a difference. Now, a question comes, is this a timing difference? The answer is yes. Why? Because it is bonus, which could be deducted in the next year if you make the payment. So, as soon as you make a bonus payment, it is deductible, which means whatever difference got created now will be sorted out when it is actually paid. So, it is a timing difference. Okay. Now, accordingly, first, first, decide which taxes will you pay. Which one will you pay? Will you pay according to accounting? Will you pay according to income tax? You will pay 60,000 to the government and not 45,000. There arose a 15,000 difference. What should I do for that? Create a deferred tax. Why? Because it is a timing difference. Create a deferred tax. Okay. So, that is how you have to bring it up. Now, whenever it, there is a deferred tax, either it is deferred tax asset or it is deferred tax liability. Okay, I will continue that example a bit later, but I will just first tell you what about how to create deferred tax asset and when to create deferred tax liability. Okay, now deferred tax asset ka relationship is pay higher tax now. Benefit in future of paying lower taxes. Now try to understand. Try to understand. You have paid a higher taxes compared to accounting. If you pay higher taxes, what happened? 
you pay higher taxes at that time you will get a benefit in future what is that benefit because it's a timing difference now so if you pay higher taxes now in future you have to pay lower taxes it's like you are making a prepaid tax payment now only so that in the future you can enjoy it which has got this kind of characteristic that you make the payment now have a good benefit in future future economic benefit which one tells this asset tells this so it is dt so dta is created when income tax paid is more than tax expense so whenever compared to accounting taxes if you make the actual current tax more then you create dta then when do you give dtl pay lower tax now now because it is a timing difference what will be the consequence in future there is an obligation to pay higher tax so if you pay low tax now in future you may have to pay a higher tax so there is an obligation to pay higher tax in future so if there is an obligation in future who tells this liability tell. so dta pay high tax now get a benefit in future dtl pay low tax now have an obligation in future because in the exam or in the material also they will not tell when to create an asset and when to create a liability you should know that it's based on the characteristics so that is when you create dta or dtl now just think about this one the example which i told you i wrote only dt over there i did not say, say whether it is a or l now think about it you have supposed to pay according to taxes right how much is that 60000 so if 60000 is what you want to pay compared to 45 you are paying a higher amount of tax what will be happening in future you may have to pay lower amount of tax there is a benefit which one will tell about benefit a will tell about benefit this is dta pay higher tax now have a benefit in future dta okay now i will just slightly continue for the next year for the same transaction for the same transaction i will continue it for the next year again accounting profit and taxation profit assume that amount wise we increased that 1 1 lakh each 3 lakh each now bonus of the last year is paid in the current year that is the case when last year came into the picture accounting you have already deducted it because under accrual basis it belonged to the last year you deducted in the last year itself in tax you will deduct now because you actually paid in the current year so what happened 3 lakh this is 2 lakh 50 Again, let's go with 30% tax bracket. This will be 90,000. This will be 75,000. Now, first difference is how much? 15,000. That to that extent, DTA will be created. Don't get confused. It is deferred tax asset. So it is on taxes, not on profits. So it is supposed to be done after multiplying with 30%. Okay. Now, again, take the difference. How much do you get? 15,000. So, what is this? Comparatively, there is a reversal. Are we able to understand now? Whatever difference arose in year 1, that reversal, that difference got closed in year 2. Those things are called as reversal element. Now, point to be remembered, whenever you find the reversal effect, reverse the existing DTA or DTL do not create a new one. Again, I repeat, whenever there is reversal element which you find, reverse the already A or L created, do not create a new one. The reason I am telling you is, look into this, 75 and 90. Look this one, 75 and 90. Now, what is happening? 75 is less. You are paying a lesser tax. Therefore, you feel that this is a liability. Pay less, have more obligation in future. But are you getting an obligation for this? No. Why? Because it is last year benefit now getting enjoyed. Last year you paid higher amount. Now you are enjoying it. Therefore, this is reversal DTA. 
last year I created DTA, this year I will reverse DTA. Why? You are having a reversal effect. Okay? If you have a fresh effect, create DTA or DTL. Find a reversal effect, then reverse that DTA, DTL. That's how it should be done. So what did we learn here? We learned that whenever there is reversal effect, at that time, reverse DTA or DTL do not create new one. Okay, then should we apply always these kind of profit calculation and then only calculate DTA or DTL? The other question you get. For that, you need not get the profit actually. You can directly calculate DTA or DTL. How? Deferred taxes is equal to timing difference into tax rate. Now, I will show you in the example. That example only will, will try to cover up as many things as possible. Now, see, what is the timing difference between these two? 50,000. Timing difference will apply for profits. So, accounting profit 1,50,000, taxation profit 2 lakh. What's the timing difference? 50,000. What is the tax rate? 30%. What is the amount? 15,000. Matching with the DTA amount over here. Which means, how to calculate deferred taxes then? Timing difference into tax rate will give you the deferred taxes. But the only thing what you have to check is, whether that timing difference will lead to more payment of tax or less payment of tax. Less payment DTL, more payment DTA. So that's how this particular job of calculating elements is supposed to come. Once we know how to calculate them, the next part is about this deferred taxes itself as to how it could be recognized. Now, when it comes to DT recognition point DTA or DTL, now, DTL represents obligation, therefore, it should be recognized all times. So, whenever you have got DTL, it's an obligation, it's a liability. Any time you can show the liability, you have to show it. Okay, you have to recognize it, there is no choice, DTL will come on the liability side of the balance sheet. What about DTA? Whether DTA is talking about benefit? The answer is yes. Which means overstating an asset is never allowed. So therefore, whenever there is DTA, you should present certainty of reversal. So, whenever you are creating DTA, future economic benefit should be there. What is the future economic benefit? Tax payment will be less. So, that reversal certainty you have to show. You can show it, then only create DTA. Otherwise, don't even create it. Because AS doesn't allow you to create. Okay. Then, I will just add on. If the enterprise is under losses, if the enterprise is under losses, at that time what happens? Reversal can never take place. Because what is the reversal for a DTA? Paying a lesser amount of tax. For paying a lesser amount of tax, first there has to be tax in the first place. Here there is no tax only. Why? It is under losses. If they are under losses, you have to apply set off and carry forward of loss provision. Tax payment provision doesn't even come into the picture. Therefore, if the concern is under losses, can we recognize DTA? It will be allowed only if virtual certainty is established. Virtual certainty that this is going to happen. Whatever I am going to tell you, that will happen. That is virtual certainty. It's possibility of more than 90% range. We call them as virtual certainty. So, point to be understood. Whenever you create DTA, it has to be certain for reversible. But 
in this case only if there are losses reversibility is highly doubtful so therefore the concern has to prove virtual certainty for us okay that is how dta dtl ka creation dtl created at all times dta created only when it could be reversed then this particular dta stuff should be reviewed every year reviewed every year whenever they find that there is no benefit derivable then reverse dt continuous 8 years they are totally under losses they are not coming to profit at all your set off and carry forward also applies for 8 years these people are not making profit at all then what reverse dta don't keep it because you are under loss you can't rec reverse the dta part then close dta don't keep it so that's how we have to consider the creation element of d and dt okay so what did we learn then dta dtl creation mechanism we learnt whereby it will be done according to high payment or low payments it is timing difference into percentage accordingly if at all you make a high payment dta will be created make a low payment dtl will be created whenever you find a reversal effect or whenever you find that timing difference is getting reversed reverse the original account do not create a new one okay next there are two special effects which we have to know when it comes to this standard the first one is tax holiday say 10 double a is there 80 ia ib there are so many sections which tells you tax holiday what does that mean no tax payments for a period no tax payments for a period we call them as tax holiday whenever there is tax holiday how do we recognize dta or dtl whether do we need to recognize deferred tax assets or liability for that we say if reversible during holiday then do not create if reversible after holiday what do you mean by holiday tax holiday don't get confused reversible after holiday then create so anything which is going to be reversed bonus for example year 1 ka bonus will be paid in year 2 assume that 5 year exemption is there 5 year tax holiday year 1 bonus is paid in year 2 now will this be considered for reversibility purpose no because it is arising in tax holiday reversing in tax holiday then no need to create dt at all but arose in the year 3 reversed in the year 8 8 doesn't come under exemption time therefore create dt so if it is arising and reversing in the same period don't create but if it is arising and reversing in the next period then you have to create so that's how you have to consider tax holiday effect later what about mat there is something called as minimum alternate tax minimum alternate tax now whenever there is mat requirement i'll just give you an overall idea about this and later what is as22 going to tell us because some questions could be asked out of this when it comes to mat what happens is they will ask you to calculate book profit according to income tax law you okay, know what is book profit book profit is basically accounting profit with changes okay book profit accounting profit with changes we call them as book profit multiply 18.5 percent of book profit we call that as mat tax rate is 18.5 percent okay, mat rate is 18.5 percent now you get a particular amount then apply normal provisions of IT law then multiply it with 30 percent 
again compare whichever is higher will be paid as taxes if at all book profit book profit is not your accounting profit book profit means profit calculated according to 115 jb there is a section called as 115 jb covered by the income tax law that section tells us that you have to calculate book profit where account profit plus minus there are certain adjustment to be done now you need not know it just know that book profit is something created by the it law so you make that calculation you you get the value of book profit multiply it with 18.5% you'll get an amount then do your normal calculation of taxes into 30% another amount whichever is higher is paid to the government okay so because of this what happened there is tax expense or i will say tax profit there is accounting profit now arose another thing called as book profit how will this effect my deferred taxes is the question for that he has said in a very simple note do not consider book profit for the purpose of deferred taxes for deferred taxes it's always accounting profit taxation profit ignore everything else you need not consider that at all okay so this is how you have to deal with mat effect where you will be having two separate elements called as book profit and normal provision normal provision is current tax element whichever is higher will be paid as taxes to the government then for the purpose of dt do not consider any sort of mat requirement just forget that mat is applicable just do it normally what is that accounting profit tax profit so this is how you are supposed to deal with mat requirement finally one conclusiveness i can tell you is that tax expense one formula to end is equal to current tax plus or minus deferred tax current tax plus or minus deferred tax that is going to tell you the tax expense now when do you use plus plus is used when it is dtl minus is used when it is dt should we check it once should we check it once see here this example which i told you where did it go yeah it's here just check this example what is the formula i told you tax expense is equal to current tax plus or minus deferred tax we created asset asset i told you it is minus so what is tax expense this one tax according to accounting so 45000 is equal to how much is current tax 60000 60000 minus how much deferred tax you created 15000 just see it tallies so dta minus dtl plus that's how you need to get your tax expense all together okay so again we'll quickly revise this up there will be accounting profit tax profit there will be mismatch that mismatch will be considered as number 1 timing difference number 2 permanent difference if it is timing difference then dt will be created permanent difference ignored dt when you create if at all you pay higher taxes now it is dt a if you pay lower taxes now it is dt l in future if you find the reversal effect then reverse these two accounts do not create a new one then finally if it is within tax holiday if arising and reversal happens within tax holiday don't create dt if it is reversal after tax holiday create dt so this is how it is supposed to be done amount wise how do we calculate timing difference into rate of taxes now if at all i have to take one example based on that so that the, we will conclude the whole standard uh, understanding let's assume that uh say yeah depreciation according to accounts it is 1 lakh according to tax it is say 2 lakh Okay, depreciation is a timing difference. According to accounting, it is one lakh. According to taxation, it is two lakh. Now, what happened? There is a timing difference of one lakh. Difference between the two, it's a timing difference. 
So therefore, there is a timing difference of 1 lakh. Whenever there is timing difference, you need to create DT. How much will you create? 1. It is, say, if 30% is the tax rate, 1 lakh into 30% will give me 30,000. Timing difference into rate of tax is equal to deferred tax amount. Again, a question comes. Will this lead to DTA or will this lead to DTL? Always when a question of that sort is asked, check this one. Because you pay taxes according to IT law, right? So check the tax part. You claimed a depreciation of 2 lakh according to taxes, higher. If you claim higher depreciation, depreciation is an expense. The more expense you claim, the lesser profits will come, the lesser taxes you pay. More expense, lesser tax. Less expense, more tax. Correct? So therefore, since you claimed more expense, you have supposed to pay lesser tax. That is number one. If you pay less expense or if you claim less expense, more payment will arise. That's how the whole understanding should be done. So, come to this one now. 2 lakh is the amount of depreciation claimed. You claimed a higher amount of expense. This will lead to lower tax. Therefore, this will lead to DTL. So, that is how you have to consider creation element. Accordingly, you have to see. So, this is how AS22 should be understood. So, all the rules have been now taken up. Now, let's quickly check a problem based on this. So, that it will become easy for us. Once the problems are done, we will stop today's discussion of this particular standard. Let's start it now. I'll read it. Rama Limited has provided the following information. Depreciation as per accounting records. Depreciation as per income tax records. Unamortized preliminary expense as per tax record. There is adequate evidence of future profit sufficiency. You are required to calculate the amount of deferred tax asset or liability to be recognized as transition adjustment assuming tax rate 30%. So, there are two elements here. There is depreciation, there is preliminary expense. First, let's see depreciation. According to accounting, 6 lakh. According to income tax, 10 lakh. So, what does that mean? You claimed a higher expenditure in taxes. Always compare with this one only. You claimed a higher expenditure in taxes. Since you claimed higher expenditure in taxes, you pay less tax. If you pay less tax now, there is an obligation in future. This will lead to DTL. How much? Timing difference. 4 lakh into 30%. 1 lakh 20. Okay, so this is about first depreciation. I hope it is clear. Then unamortized preliminary expense as per tax record. Now, when it comes to preliminary expense, what do we know? In accounting, you always do it at 100%. You finish it off. Very first year, you claim the entire preliminary expense. But what about tax? It should be done in five installments. So, therefore, now if you compare, if 100 rupees is there, first year only accounting entire 100 will go, but tax only 20 rupees will go. So, therefore, whenever it comes to unamortized preliminary expense, you claim less expense according to tax. Because in accounting, you would have deducted entire 100%. So, therefore, you claim less amount of expense according to tax. You pay higher taxes. This will lead to DTA asset. Claim less expense, pay higher taxes, DTA. How much? 60,000 into 30%, 18,000. Difference they have taken and they said there is a net DTL of how much? 1 lakh 2,000. So I hope this is how you have to create DTA and DTL. Next question. The following particulars are stated in the balance sheet of PQR Limited as on 31st March 18. 31st March 18. DTL, DTA. Okay. The following transactions were reported. 30% is the tax rate. Depreciation as per books. Depreciation for tax. Items disallowed in 17-18 and allowed for tax purpose in 18-19. Disallowed in 17-18 for tax. Allowed in 18-19. Donation to private trust. Accordingly, you have to do it. What is given? Opening balance of DTA and DTL is given. Then, 18-19 is the transactions during the year. Accordingly, now if you see, depreciation as per books is 80, as per tax is 70. 
okay now what institute is telling is that in accounting you follow slm in tax you follow wdv and whenever you follow wdv at the initial year your depreciation will be more compared to slm because slm will go on a systematic basis but whenever it comes to wdv initial years higher later years lower so therefore now you can see that higher amount of depreciation is now reducing to lower level are you able to understand if at all it is taxes wdv normally the depreciation has to be more like this one previous question but here it has got reduced because of that what happened institute say that it is a reversal effect since it is reversal reverse <coughs> dtl you would have created dtl before because you would have claimed a higher tax uh, or you would have paid a lower tax and paid a higher tax benefit therefore you would have created dtl before now you have to reverse it you can go with the assumption in the exam saying that it's a new transaction and you can create dta for that i'm not saying no but institute is telling initially you would have got a higher amount of depreciation now it is reducing which means it's a reversal effect okay next items disallowed in 1718 allowed in 1819 if it is disallowed in 1718 understand this carefully here there is no choice if it is disallowed in 1718 in the last year you would have created dta because it is disallowed in last year basically means what you paid a higher tax so it created dta in the last year now what they are saying it is allowed means what reversal last year it is allowed this year allowed last year dta this year reversal of dta accordingly 10 lakh is the amount 30 percent is the tax rate 10 lakh into 30 percent okay third one donation to private trust sorry donation to private trust is always not going to come because it is disallowed expenditure disallowed expenditure will always lead to permanent difference permanent difference there is no dta dtl at all doesn't come so this is how you have to check initial transaction create dta dtl if you find a reversibility reverse dta dtl that is what is done in this problem okay so this is the way in which you have to consider the answering element whenever as 22 questions are asked with this we will end our today's discussion provisions contingent liability and contingent assets okay so this will be considered for as 29 purpose each term has to be understood properly some other sub topics and this particular standard comes to an end most of the time this standard requires judgmental quotient because a lot of judgments are involved so each word what is used by the standard is very important now starting with the first term called as provision now first let's try to understand the meaning of the word provision and afterwards let's see according to as 29 when provision is supposed to get created now first of all what do we mean by the term provision provision is basically a liability okay meaning of the term provision provision is basically a liability but not just a normal liability whereby it is measured it is measured according to it is measured according to substantial degree of remission okay now what is the difference between a normal liability and a provision normal liability is what obviously it's a liability where the measurement is done bank loan for example you don't estimate anything you have taken there is an obligation you have to pay that's it 
बट वॉट अबाउट प्रोविजन इट इज अ लाइबिलिटी बट इट ऑलवेज डिपेंड्स अपॉन सब्सटैंशियल डिग्री ऑफ एस्टिमेशन इट ऑलवेज डिपेंड्स अपॉन एस्टिमेशन सो वेदर प्रोविजन आर एक्चुअल्स देन द आंसर इज नो प्रोविजन कैन नेवर बी एक्चुअल्स इफ एट ऑल इट मे मैच ऑन सम डे बट इट कैन नेवर बी द सेम बिकॉज इट ऑलवेज रन अकॉर्डिंग टू एस्टिमेशन so you will estimate it and then you will try to bring it up since it is related to estimation there is a need or there is a requirement of when to create a provision so provision is a liability which depends upon substantial degree of estimation so since it is estimation there comes a question when does provision creation becomes necessary for that the standard said there are certain conditions involved what are they it is a present obligation arising out of past event arising out of past event third probable probable future economic benefit outflow for cost is reliably measured if these conditions are satisfied then you have to create a provision so four conditions what are they present obligation arising out of past event probable future economic benefit outflow cost is reliably measured Okay. Now all these four seems technical. Let's try to break them up. Let's try to break these things, and we will try to get a meaning of it so that it could be utilized. Now, what do you mean by a present obligation? What do you mean by a present obligation? First, obligation should be present basically. Okay, present obligation basically means obligation should be present. Present on what date? Present on balance sheet date. there has to be an obligation on the balance sheet date whether it is a total obligation no present obligation basically means it is probable the word what we normally use is most likely than not most likely than not so obligation is there is more than obligation is not there which means more than 50% probability it will be a present obligation okay more than 50% probability it is a present obligation thereby on the balance sheet date it's most likely that there is an obligation that will be called as a present obligation example i will keep one example and i'll try to rotate it for every everything okay let's keep one example and we'll try to rotate for every other stuff say uh okay i'll go with uh, provision for warranty provision for warranty now present obligation on balance sheet date okay so first is there a chance that warranty claims might come to us the answer is yes if i make a sale warranty claims will come most likely we don't know yet they may, they may come they may not come but it's most likely that they may come so therefore it's a present obligation okay this is first second past event past event basically means it has to be an obligating event it has to create an obligation for us okay now when it comes to provision for warranty what is the past event sale is the past event sale gave me an obligation that i have to now go for warranty whereby whenever they come i am supposed to repair it to them so what happened here there is an obligating event so past event is always going to create an obligating event if there is no obligating event then do not consider for the purpose of provision which we will see later i'll give you another example afterwards there is probable 
future economic benefit outflow probable future economic benefit outflow now again they have used the word probable which means more than 50 percent likely that payment is there so payment will arise more than 50 percent chances are there that payment will arise that is probable future economic benefit outflow if the payment may not arise it's not probable then there is no need for a provision okay fourth one cost is reliably measured Now, what do you mean by reliably measured? So, basically, it should be reliably done. You cannot just say a random word. It should be reliably done. So, therefore, either go for expert advice or expert opinion or experience. All these things will give you reliance. So, whatever estimate you are doing, there is actually a basis for it. Without basis, don't just shout a particular money. So, if these conditions are satisfied, it is going to create a provision obligation. So, it is a present obligation, which means on the balance sheet date, the, even, uh, the obligation might arise most likely. Second, out of past event, past event should be an obligating event. A probable future economic benefit will outflow, it goes out. Then, fourth is cost is reliably measured. So, provision for warranty, we have seen that one, there is a uh, present obligation. Past event also we looked into it. Sale is the past event. Now, is there any outflow? Yes, I may have to give some spare parts. I may have to give some service charges. All of them will be done for free. So, for me, it's an, uh, it's an outflow. Three, four, whether it could be measured? Yes, by experience, I can tell. I can ask certain experts about it. They will tell me and accordingly, I will create. So, this is going to tell you about whether provision should be created or not. Okay, second. If at all I have to take another example, suppose if it is related to future, okay, for example, uh, suppose say that there is supposed to be one of the thing which is going to happen in future, example, I want to purchase 2 lakh units after 6 months, some 2 lakh units of a particular product is needed after 6 months, you approach the person and ask that person after 6 months whether 2 lakh units of this specifications say 2 lakh pencils will this be available with you that person said yes it will be available with me so you said so i can order it any any time i want he said okay you can order it done now a question comes as on today only should i create a provision for it because we are sure that we want to buy and all these stuff but am i supposed to create a provision now only no why because past event there is no obligating event you may cancel that order and you may go with somebody else also. And there is no contractual obligation over here. You ask them, he said, okay, done. You just cut the call. You planned it. But there is nothing like you are going to buy from him. There is no obligation as such, which means there is no need for creating provision. So, obligating event should be there for you to have a provision. Okay. So, this is how a provision requirement is supposed to come. Now, whenever provision is created, only one thing has been added to this particular standard on a recent basis. What they have said is, whenever there is a provision related to decommissioning or restoration of PPE, if you remember, in the first group, we have dealt with PPE, where we said even decommissioning, restoration and all other similar liabilities will be added to the cost of PPE, correct? So, if it is there, you can create provision on discounted basis. You can create provision on a discounted basis, okay? But for others, no discounting others no discounting only for ppe related ones there is discounting okay so what basically is the discounting element works your present value factor so for example 5 lakh is the amount of decommissioning expense after 5 years so after 5 years 5 lakh is the decommissioning expense i have to incur since it is after 5 years you can discount it for the present time being 
So what will I do? Assume that a discounting rate has to be taken. Say 8% discounting rate will be taken. Okay, 8% discounting rate will be taken and accordingly 5 lakh into PVIF for 8% 5 years. So 5 years 8%. So let's quickly check this up. 1 divided by 1.08. So 5 lakh into 0 0.68, so which will get it as say 3 lakh 40,000 we get. For example, I will take the round off amount, 3 lakh 40,000 we get, which means this 3 lakh 40,000 is added to PPE. Provision is created to this extent. But what about the rest amount? 5 lakh is the actual obligation. Na? If you discount it, it is coming up to 3,40,000. Great. So, after 5 years, I have to pay 5 lakh, which means every year, which is 5 lakh minus 3,40,000. You have a difference of 1,60,000. Every year, this 1,60,000 will shift to PNL. In the sense, not entire 1,60,000, according to the discounting factors. According to discounting factor, an amount equaling to a total of 1,60,000 will be shifted to p and L and provision. So, the entry will be p and L to provision. Whereby, this amount keeps on getting changed. If you could remember that AS19, we used to apply that finance charges in that way. So, in that way, you have to just bring that up and put it over here. Okay. So, that is how you have to deal with the provision requirement under AS29. So, for PPE related discounting is allowed, for others no, there is no discounting obligation or discounting methodology allowed. Then contingent liability. The second one talks about contingent liability. Now, contingent liability actually has two definitions. Okay. First definition is present obligation which is your provision related one itself, present obligation, there is past event, but there is no probable future economic benefit outflow and there is no cost reliably estimated. So, there is no reliable estimate of cost, there is no future economic benefit outflow. In that case, there is again a contingent liability. Okay, present obligation is there, but future outsource may not be there. Example, I have I had an obligation, had a contractual obligation with a friend, but there was some problem which took place where I am not able to pay him. Now there are there is a present obligation. I am not I have not paid him, which means there is an obligation to pay. But he is a friend. Maybe he will say no need. It's fine. Take some more time and pay it to me. It's totally okay. In that case, no outflow is there. If there is no outflow, show it as a contingent liability. Okay. Then, other major definition of contingent liability is there is a possible obligation arising out of past event arising out of past event existence confirmed by happening or non happening of future uncertain events future uncertain events 
not under control of enterprise not under control of enterprise okay first possible obligation which means the chances is less than 50 percent possible obligation so it is not going to create more than 50 percent chance less than 50 percent chance may happen may not happen we don't know again arising out of past event again as i've already told you there has to be an event third the existence depends upon happening or non-happening of future uncertain events. Even I don't know what is going to happen. Okay. It depends upon whether there is a going to happen or not going to happen. I have no idea. That is the fourth point. Not under the control of the enterprise. Enterprise is not under the control. That cannot control anything here. It is waiting for it. If it is leading to payment, then okay. If it's not leading to payment, then also okay. If it's leading to payment, possible will get converted to present. Not leading to payment, it's gone. Which means anything might happen when it comes to contingent liability. Now, what is example? Say I will consider bills discounted example. Now, in bills discounted, what is going to happen? Drawer will go to bank, hand over the bill and collect money. Correct? Later, what bank is supposed to do? Bank is supposed to go with the drawee and collect the money. Okay. But the point is, if drawee doesn't pay the money, bank is going to ask drawer for the money. That is how the contract is. The bill discount contract is, once drawer goes to the bank, he is going to put the bill, collect money. Later, bank is supposed to get the money from drawee. If it doesn't collect the money from drawee, bank will collect it from drawer because he is the person who is directly under contract with me. Drawee is not under my contract. So, therefore, they will directly collect it from drawer. Now, think from the drawer point of view. Okay, drawer point of view. Check whether there is a possible obligation. The answer is yes. Why? Because there are chances that I may have to pay. If drawee doesn't pay, then I have to pay now. Arising out of past event, yes. What is that past event? I discounted the bill. Third, now existence of this particular settlement depends upon happening or non-happening of future uncertain event. Whereby, drawee may pay, may not pay. I don't know. If drawee pays, I don't have a liability. If drawee doesn't pay, I have a liability. Fourth, not under my control. I, I can't control drawee. Which means, Till the date of maturity of the bill, drawer, it is a contingent liability. Okay, because there are chances of payment arising out of past event where it depends upon a happening or non happening of future uncertain event, and the draw, uh, fourth one is not under the control of the enterprise. Same another example if I have to give you legal cases. Experts, the lawyer has told us that. The lawyer has told us that you may win the case, you may not win the case. If it is still 50-50, we have no clue what may happen. At that time, possible obligation, past event, happening or non-happening, I don't have control. Again, contingent liability comes into existence. So, that is how you have to see when the contingent liability effect is supposed to come. Okay. Now, both of them are under the obligation mindset. So, therefore, whenever you have provision, it is a liability which will be accounted in the books. Important because this comes inside the financial statements. So, it is liability which is recorded in books. What about contingent liability? Contingent liability is only given as note to financial statements. It does not come inside the financial statements. It just comes as a footnote to financial statements. Again, it's important because the shareholders, the users should know what contractual obligations the company has. This is about contingent liability and provisions. Now, contingent asset. Contingent asset. Now, same thing, just replace word asset in place of obligation. 
same definition of what we wrote here instead of the word obligation re remove that word and put asset over there possible asset arising out of past event existence confirmed by happening or non happening of future uncertain event the enterprise does not have any control over this that is the definition for contingent asset okay now the point of contingent asset is are we supposed to account for it are we supposed to disclose it first don't account no accounting has to be done for contingent asset the reason is very simple we have to apply prudence because contingent asset will lead to income if it leads to income and if it doesn't lead it later it's only possible right since it is only possible you may get the income you may not get the income if you just assume that you will get the income and pass the entry later the income is not received then the shareholders are going to scold you like anything so therefore better don't account it at all okay when it could be accounted accounting could be done when it is certain now mainly we say virtually certain there is a virtual certainty so only when there is a virtual certainty virtual certainty means it is going to happen you have every right to do it for example till court passes a judgment till court passes a judgment you cannot say for example i won't go for that i'll go with this only say that bill discounted itself for bank collecting it from the drawer is a contingent asset because until and unless draw if doesn't pay then drawer has to pay na so till that bill date maturity for the bank collecting money from drawer is a possible asset you may collect it on a later date but the point is if at all you go with that mindset and if at all draw it directly pays it you have to reverse this whatever you thought that you may receive from drawer you may have to reverse it again it will affect on an adverse basis so therefore do not account for it but date of maturity came date of maturity came drawee did not pay now it is virtually certain that i have to collect it from drawer only now it is an asset now account for it no problem till date of maturity it is possible you may get you may not get so till that date it's possible don't show it once maturity came in drawee dishonored the bill now it is confirmed that i will collect it from drawer now it is your asset now record for it no problem because it is virtually certain so that is the basis through which you have to consider contingent asset okay so there has to be virtual certainty then record in books otherwise no recording then if it is significant then probable contingent asset probable i am saying probable contingent asset not actual probable contingent asset may be disclosed in director's report not all the time but if it is needed disclosed in director's report okay this is how contingent asset mechanism will come don't account for it then if at all you get a virtual certainty then record it then director's report if needed could be said for probable ones next in the same contingent asset mechanism only if we further continue if at all there is any reimbursement which may happen reimbursement where it will lead towards both payment as well as an asset now what does that basically means i am a mediator whereby i have to pay for someone and i will collect it from somebody else for example mr a asked me to make a payment to mr c so i will make the payment to mr c i will collect the amount from mr a reimbursable ones reimbursements are going to happen now whenever reimbursement is supposed to happen can i consider that as an asset payment is there because whenever reimbursement comes into the picture payment is there first i will pay then i will collect that only is called as reimbursement question comes whether asset could be recognized or not for that we say if it is virtually certain or again virtual certainty is present then only go for asset recognition otherwise don't which means with mr a 
I have a contract. That saying that whatever payments I make to Mr. C, Mr. A will make the payment to me. Another example, say we are auditors. So we go to client place and we audit them. Okay. Now we incur certain expenses for audit. Some audit, whatever expense we incur might be reimbursed by our client also. Now, when can I consider this reimbursement of my expense as an asset which is collectible from the client? Only if there is a contract telling that client will reimburse. Because in the contract they may say, I will reimburse only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 cost. I will not be doing anything other than these numbering what I have given. Which means if I incur a 13th cost which is not in, included in the contract, that is not reimbursable. So therefore, don't consider that as an asset. Only when you have virtual certainty. There is a contract. So in the contract that I mentioned, all your travel expense will be reimbursed, food expense will be reimbursed. In that time, consider them as an asset. You incurred it, you will collect it from the client later. So those things are called as reimbursement requirement of assets. Sometimes they may ask it in the exam, so be ready with it. Only if there is a virtual certainty of collection, virtual certainty that there is some contractual obligation or something, then consider it as an asset. Otherwise, no. Okay. So, these are supposed to be considered from the reimbursement angle. Okay. So, majorly these are the ones which are covered from AS 29 angle. So, when do you create provision? When do you create contingent liability? How contingent assets are treated? Then what are the reimbursement requirement under AS 29? So, these are the ones which are covered. Now, let us quickly look into the Q&A segment and with that today's discussion of accounting standards will come to an end. Now let's jump into it. First one. Yeah. Alpha Limited has entered into a sale contract of rupees 7 crore with Gamma Limited during 2018-19 financial year. The profit on this transaction is 1 crore. The delivery of goods to take place during the first month of 2019-20 FY. In case of failure of Alpha Limited to deliver within the schedule, a compensation of 2 crore is to be paid to Gamma Limited. Alpha Limited planned to manufacture the goods during the last month of 1819 FY. As on balance sheet date, which is 31319, the goods were not manufactured and it was unlikely that Alpha Limited will be in a position to meet the contractual obligation. You are required to advise Alpha Limited on requirement of provision for contingency in the financial statements for the year ended 31319 in line with provisions of AS29. So, what is happening here? They are in a contract whereby Alpha Limited should provide goods to Gamma Limited worth 7 crore and it should be supplied within the month of April of the next year. Now, Alpha started producing it, but they are not sure that whether they are going to meet the deadline or not. For that reason, now they are asking whether this 2 crore which is the penalty which is supposed to be paid for not meeting the obligation should be paid or not. Okay, provision wise. First, what is, check the definition. First, probable, sorry, present obligation. Now, is there a present obligation over here? What is present obligation? Most likely than not. More than 50% chances are there that there is an obligation. Now, what is alpha saying? Goods were not manufactured and it was unlikely that Alpha Limited will be in a position to meet the contractual obligation. So, they are not able to meet the contractual obligation. If at all they are not able to meet the contractual obligation, penalty obligation is most likely. They may have to pay the penalty, which means it is a present obligation. Arising out of past event, yes, there is an event whereby they have signed an agreement saying that they are going to provide goods. If not, they will pay a damages worth 2 crore rupees. Second, probable outflow, yes, amount is already there. Reliable estimate is also there, which means create a provision, should provide. Other sentences, you look into the answer, but I am just bringing out the highlight effect. They have to provide for it over here. So, that is answer number one. Second, with reference to AS29, how would you deal with the following in the annual accounts of the company at the balance sheet date? An organization operates an offshore oil field where its licensing agreement requires it to remove the oil rig at the end of production and restore the seabed. 90% of the eventual costs related to the removal of the oil rig 
and restoration of damage caused by building it and 10% arise through the extraction of oil. At the balance sheet date, the rig has been constructed but no oil has been extracted. Okay, now first look into the question. It operates an offshore oil field where licensing agreement requires it to remove the oil rig at the end of production and restore the seabed. That is what they are saying. Remove the oil rig and restore the seabed. 90% of the eventual cost relates to removal of the oil and restoration of damage caused by building it. And 10% arise through extraction of oil. At the end of balance sheet date, rig has been constructed but no oil has been extracted. Now look into it. The point is there is already a contractual obligation that remove the oil rig, restore the seabed. There is a contractual obligation. You have to do it no matter what. How much do you extract? How much you don't extract? Nobody cares. If you are in that contract, oil rig removal, restoring the seabed. That is contractual obligation which you have to meet. A question comes, sir, we are yet to do that, right? It's in future. But still, the obligation tells you that you have to do it. Even though in future, you have to do it. Now, is there a chance that you may escape that? I gave you an example, purchasing after 6 months, there is a chance of escaping, but here there is no chance of escaping. You have to do it means you have to do it, which means even though it's a future event, it's an obligating event. Therefore, it comes under provision. But oil extraction depends upon actually extracting the oil. That is totally left to you. If you extract the oil, then there might be any provision which might be needed. Otherwise, it, there is no need because there is no contractual obligation that oil extraction should happen like this, nothing like that. So, therefore, for oil extraction, there need not be a provision, but for that oil bed, it should be there. So, 90% which they have mentioned, uh, where did that go? Yeah, 90% you have to provide for it. The rest 10%, there is no need for doing it. Okay, that is the answer which is given over here. I have pasted it. Look into it later. Okay, then second one. During 1819, Ace Limited gives a guarantee of certain borrowings of Brew Limited whose financial condition at that time is sound. During 1920, financial condition of Brew deteriorates and on 31st December, it goes into liquidation. So now look into it. Two years has been mentioned, 1819-1920. What have we done? We gave a guarantee. If there is a guarantee, then what happens is the point. So, first, 1819, the financial condition is sound, which means there is no problem with the company. Which means, is there a present obligation? Is there a most likely than not that I have to pay? No. Because they are correct, they are sound, no issues at all. But there is a possible obligation. Even though that person is sound, if at all he escapes, I have to pay. So, there is a possible obligation. Less than 50% chance that I may pay. So, therefore, for the year 1819, it's a contingent liability. There is a possible obligation arising out of past event, depends upon happening or non happening, and I don't have a control. However, for 1920, it deteriorates, and 31st December 19, it goes into liquidation. Means their financial situation is not good. So, for 1920, as on 31 3 2020, there is a present obligation. Chances of me paying is more than chances of me not paying. So, therefore, for 1920, you have to create a provision. Okay, but it depends upon the estimate. It depends upon how much cost might flow and all these things. That is not mentioned over here. So, assuming that cost should be measured and there is outflow, you may have to create a provision. So, this is the answer what you have to bring out. So, every time you have to go with these definitions only. Present obligation, whether my payment is more likely than not paying. If yes, present obligation. There is, is there an obligating event? Yes. Is there any outflow? Yes. Can it be measured? Yes. Then provision. If at all it is, there is no outflow, the, you, there is no measurement as such, contingent liability. Then, is there a possible obligation? Payment is lesser. Compared to not payment, so less than 50% chance of payment, possible. Past event, I don't have a control, depends upon happening or non-happening. It leads to contingent liability. So that's how you have to look into it. Okay. So with this, we come to the end of AS 29.